Soviet Union support the return of the monarchy to Italy in 1944. This horrified the Republicans who had helped liberate the country from Mussolini's dictatorship. Why did the Soviet Union strike up warm relations with Egypt when scores of Egyptian communists were imprisoned and the Communist Party banned? Why did Stalin sign a peace treaty with Hitler when Germany was its greatest enemy? Images of the Cold War have haunted the West for over 40 years. They tell the epic saga of battling giants, the two superpowers, Hollywood heroes warring against the unscrupulous intrigues of Soviet aggressors, protecting the world from the verge of global catastrophe. Since the Second World War, hostility towards the Soviet Union has been based on the fear of the overthrow of democracy in Europe, the ideological battleground of the Cold War. Revolution and unrest in the real Cold War battleground, the Third World, served only as more evidence to the West of the unrelenting expansion of Soviet power. Despite the Western view, the media images, the stereotypes, despite the rhetoric of the Soviets themselves, there is another story to be told. For real or imaginary reasons, the West may have overestimated Soviet military strength, while at the same time ignoring the political constraints on Soviet activities abroad caused by its weak and badly run economy. As vanguards of communist revolution, the Soviets' first instinct has always been to protect national security. The promotion of world revolution has been superseded by their need to engage with the West. The enigma that is Soviet foreign policy is often contradictory, miscalculated, and paradoxical. The contradictions begin with a profound insecurity about the hostile world outside its own borders. Preoccupation with threatened invasion and siege stretch back long before the revolution of 1917 into Russia's imperialist past. Finally overcoming centuries of foreign domination and occupation, Tsarist Russia was born. Soviet parables and images glorify the heroic defense of Mother Russia against a succession of invaders. In 1812, Napoleon began his great march toward Moscow. Time and time again, the invaders were dealt a fatal blow by the bitter Russian winter, their most powerful weapon, honored as General Winter, the defender of the motherland. Pre-revolutionary Russia was a vast country, over one-seventh of the total territory of the world. The underdeveloped republics, half of whose population were not Russian, were mainly peasants, controlled by a monarchy from a European-style capital. The Tsars had joined the imperialist great game for control over countries other than their own. In 1914, world war broke out in Europe. Russia's old enemy Germany once again advanced on Moscow. Within the first year of the war, four million Russian soldiers had been killed or injured, 
Starvation and poverty fueled civil unrest as fewer peasants and workers remained to provide fuel and food for the people and supplies of boots and rifles for the exhausted army. And then come the ten days that shake the world. In the bitter winter of 1917, soldiers, peasants and workers revolted. The battle for the USSR had begun. Lenin returned from exile to lead the workers' revolution and promised peace, bread and land to the stricken population. To fulfill the promise of peace, Trotsky and Lenin signed a peace treaty with Germany at Brest-Litovsk and were forced to give up land and 300 million gold rubles in compensation. But the Bolsheviks were now out of what Lenin saw as a capitalist war whose cannon fodder, the international working class, were their natural allies. So the question was, do you make a peace with Germany on terms that uh, give up large parts of the territory? On the other hand, if you decide to continue the war, you're breaking the promise that you've made to uh, mutinying soldiers, peasants who've been called up and so on. So that was the major issue at the time. But it was resolved with uh, Lenin saying that the Soviet Union is just too weak at this point to try and carry on the war. We have to be realists, we have to be pragmatic, and we have to make a peace even if it's one on very bad terms. So in a sense that encapsulated a lot of the problems that uh, have continued in Soviet foreign policy. How you meet the requirements of the revolution with the territorial questions of uh, war and peace. The West thought that such an example of revolution might encourage others outside Russia. This and the Russian withdrawal from the war provoked them into intervention and blockade. The West went onto the offensive by aiding the counter-revolutionaries the White Army. Churchill spoke of strangling Bolshevism in its cradle. The Bolsheviks, for their part, threatened to distribute Western-owned land in Russia to the people of the Soviet Union and cancel all foreign debts. By 1919, Britain, France, America, Italy, Japan and eight other nations sent a total of 109,000 troops to invade Russia and support the counter-revolutionaries. Britain offered $100 million and France 100 million rubles to the white generals to continue the fight against the Soviet government. The pattern of the Soviet siege mentality was set. Churchill. Were they at war with Soviet Russia? Certainly not. But they shot Soviet Russians at sight. They stood as invaders on Russian soil. They armed the enemies of the Soviet government. They blockaded its ports and sunk its battleships. They earnestly desired and schemed its downfall. Lenin did not believe it was necessary to export the revolution. He believed that pressure for social change in industrial countries would inevitably bring about the demise of capitalism and a natural transition to socialism. Meanwhile, it was necessary to peacefully coexist with the capitalist world. When it came to the issue of the Brest-Litovsk Treaty with Germany, Lenin argued for that on the basis uh, that this was a temporary disappointment and setback because the conditions for revolution in the West had not fully emerged and the movements that there were there were not yet strong enough. Stalin seemed to take it in a more... Uh, fundamental, almost cataclysmic way by saying there is no revolutionary movement in the West, almost saying it's hopeless. Therefore, we have to make peace and rely on our own resources, perhaps for many, many years. By the 1930s, Stalin felt that earlier hopes for the emergence of revolution in Western Europe had been unrealistic and that the Soviet Union was isolated in a hostile world. He turned his attention to consolidating communism within Soviet borders and to a ruthless witch-hunt of alleged counter-revolutionary agents. The brutal wave of purges eliminated thousands of the original members of the Communist Party. Shortly before the Second World War, or the Great Patriotic War as it is known in the Soviet Union, Stalin made a peace pact with the Germans. The senior ranks of the Red Army had been decimated by the purges. But still the Germans invaded. 
Stürme Dorkovno. Starke Kräfte der Sowjets verteidigen die Stadt. Western accounts of the war stress the Western role in the victory over Hitler. If Hollywood is to be believed, the entry of America into the war sealed the salvation of the free world. In fact, in the two-year siege of Leningrad alone, the Soviets suffered the combined total losses of British and American troops during the entire war. In Leningrad, Soviet casualties rose to 4,000 a day. The Soviets finally broke through the ring surrounding the city. As the Germans retreated, some murdered any Soviet people they found in their path. By the end of the war, of the five million Russians that had been taken prisoner, only two million returned. By the end of the war, the USSR had gained 600,000 square kilometers of land in the West, at the expense of Poland, the Baltic countries, Romania, Czechoslovakia and Finland. In terms of square kilometers, they recovered exactly what had been lost to the Germans in the 1918 Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Relations with the Western Allies had been an uneasy marriage of convenience for Stalin, and he needed time to rebuild Russia. Despite his suspicions about the intentions of the West, he had no appetite for further confrontation, especially as the USA now had the atom bomb and had demonstrated they were ready to use it. With their economy in ruins and the loss of 20 million people, Stalin was determined that never again would Germany have the power to invade Russia. To ensure this, he felt that pro-Soviet regimes needed to be established to act as a buffer zone against future German attack through Eastern Europe. Stalin readily agreed to the first rule of the Cold War game, spheres of influence. The Allies struck a deal to divide Europe between two power blocks. Western and Southern Europe and two of the four Scandinavian countries, Norway and Denmark, would be under the West's sphere of influence. Sweden and Finland would be neutral. To maintain Western goodwill, Stalin supported the return of the monarchy to Italy and withdrew his troops from Czechoslovakian, Danish, Norwegian and Yugoslavian territories. He stuck to his agreement with Churchill that Greece should return to British influence as Greek communists were jailed. Stalin maintained the atmosphere of siege within the Soviet Union with a spectre of counter-revolution as he suppressed and eliminated political opposition in Eastern Europe. Conciliatory to the West, harsh in Eastern Europe, Stalin showed that the popular aspirations of any other country, capitalist or communist, were secondary to those of the Soviet state. when the Russian blockade of Berlin was seen as proof of the Soviet Union bent on conquest. Stalin's motives were complex. He was fearful of the Allies establishing and rearming West Germany and using Berlin as a capitalist bridgehead against the East. When the Allies airlifted troops and supplies to break the blockade, Stalin was not willing to risk military action. <laughs> 
the degree of force the Soviet Union was willing to use in confrontation with the West had been set. Within their own sphere of influence, however, the Soviets were less cautious in their use of force to prevent moves towards independent socialist and nationalist development in Eastern Europe. After the death of Stalin in 1953, hopes of liberalization were dashed as one country after another, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland and East Germany, were held to the Moscow line. The irony of a communist power using force against communist friends and neighbors was not lost on the West. Encouraged by the Polish scene, the Hungarians began a heroic bid for freedom with a fight for life against red oppression. Scenes filmed during the Battle of Budapest show patriots fighting street by street in a desperate effort to win back their liberty at last. The Soviet Union gets a certain benefit out of a hardline anti-Soviet Western position. It justifies a certain amount of ideological hardline policies at home because it can say to its citizens, uh, you can't trust the West, they're trying to make war on us, they're trying to destabilize us, they don't understand us, look at the kind of images they have of us. So it justifies that. It certainly justifies a big military presence, uh, both in Europe and around the world in general. And there's no doubt that uh, the Soviet military, like most militaries, wants to over-insure, wants to have more weapons than it really needs, and uh, the anti-Soviet uh, pressures in the West, uh, speeches like President Reagan's evil empire speech, uh, help the Soviet military in the, in the process of demanding more money. And of course, uh, in a sense, it justifies the uh, global competition between the two superpowers. If there was no confrontation in Europe, then why would there have to be a confrontation between East and West in, uh, in Southern Africa or in the Far East, for example? It would undermine the whole validity of the concept of uh, confrontation. Soviet foreign policy sees the world in terms of concentric circles extending from the Kremlin at the center. Unlike the more global American perspective, the Soviets respond to geographic distance. The further away a country is, the less important it becomes. In 1904, a British writer, Halford Mackinder, had proposed that the continental part of Eurasia, by virtue of its size and position, was the heartland of the world. Whoever controls this landmass, once potentially Germany and now the Soviet Union, threatens the sea powers, once Great Britain, now the United States. An American writer, Alfred Mahan, had earlier concluded that the World Confederacy of Sea Powers could be secured by a series of bases around the Eurasian continent. This led to the opposing strategy of Mackinder's theory that sea powers dominate land powers by hemming them in. Herein lie the seeds of the theory of containment born from the Cold War. Under Truman's presidency in 1947, the US had formulated a post-war global policy based on anti-Sovietism, which defined most of the world as vital to America's national security. Faulty American intelligence convinced President Truman that the Red Army had remained powerful as the West demobilized. Any independent communist movement in the world was seen as Moscow enslaved. A country was either communist or anti-communist. By 1955, the U.S. had built a 6,000-mile chain of nuclear bases completely encircling the Soviet Union. Russia had been contained. If the Soviet Union didn't exist, we will have to invent it. If the Soviet Union was not there, the Third World will have no alternative except the West. And also, it is not only helping the Third World, but uh, even the West will not have a legend to use to influence the Third World. After all, a lot of uh, Third World policy of the West today is based on the theory that communism is threatening them or Russian expansion is threatening them. Uh, and uh, this, of course, means that both the West and the Third World use the Soviet Union for different reasons. While the American economy needs Third World resources and markets to maintain its dynamic growth, the Soviets remained as self-sufficient as possible. With raw materials from the vastness of Soviet Asia and the industrial production of its European satellites. 
1956, Nikita Khrushchev took up the challenge and launched the Soviet Union into global competition with the United States in space, the arms race, even economically. instances where you may be ahead of us. For example, in the development of your of the thrust of your rockets for the investigation of outer space. There may be some instances, for example, color television, where we're ahead of you. But in order for both of us for both of us to benefit, for both of us to benefit, we wish you, it means success, in that, that you show the actual possibilities of America. And we will be able to say, here are the possibilities of America. How long does it exist? How many years? 300? 300? 150 years of independence? Then we will say that America exists 150 years. Here is its level. We are 42 years, not quite. Another seven years and we will be on the same level as America. This increase in communication will teach us some things, and it will teach you some things, too. Because, after all, you don't know everything. If I don't know everything, then I would say that you know absolutely nothing about communism. Nothing except fear of it. The Soviets would join with the countries they believed would be natural allies, the newly independent former colonies of Africa and Asia, with the Soviet Union as senior partner. There seemed good reason for Khrushchev's optimism. The clashes between Egypt and Britain in the mid-1950s, the advent of Nkrumah to power in Ghana, the assertive nationalism of Sukarno in Indonesia, and the successful war of liberation in Algeria against French colonialization in 1962. Although many of these new leaders were non-aligned, Khrushchev saw them as anti-Western. To him, that meant they would be pro-Soviet. They did, in fact, strike up good relations with Moscow, but it wasn't lost on Moscow that the transformation was happening in countries that either had small communist parties or none at all. Khrushchev was more interested in their foreign policy alignments than their domestic affairs. If he had to choose between the anti-Western nationalist bourgeoisie or politically weak local communists, he would opt for the former the most powerful. Khrushchev's hopes of natural affinity between the Soviet Union and Third World nations was to bear little fruit. Third World countries found little to choose between their dealings with either of the superpowers. By taking unilateral military action in the Congo crisis in 1960, and snubbing the Third World voice in the United Nations, Khrushchev threw the Soviets into their first serious conflict with the aspirations of the Third World. Khrushchev answered the Congolese government's request to put down a secession in the copper-rich province of Katanga by flying in Soviet transport aircraft. This was outside the United Nations agreements which the newly independent countries set great store by and they were critical of Khrushchev's move. When the Soviet-supported Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba was finally overthrown in a coup, the Soviets withdrew. The Afro-Asian Conference at Bandung, being the first of its kind ever held, naturally aroused great local interest as well as worldwide attention. The non-aligned movement was born from the converging interests of third world countries. From its initial 25 member states, it has grown to 101. The movement grew out of the anti-colonial struggle and promotes third world self-determination, economic equality between rich and poor countries and independence from both East and West. President Kennedy's urgency in launching his blockade underlined a determination to prevent at almost any cost Cuba's missile build-up. When, in 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, Khrushchev backed away from confrontation with the US, many of the Soviets' Third World allies were severely shaken. The purpose of these bases 
can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. For the West, the Cold War threatened to explode outwards from the Third World into a global nuclear exchange. For the Third World and Cuba, it was a lesson that one of the few things the Soviets can offer, military support, could be withdrawn if the Americans threatened Soviet security. American superiority as a sea power spurred the Soviets to a massive naval and missile build-up for the next two decades. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. When Bembela fell in Nigeria, and coups toppled Sukarno in Indonesia, and Nkrumah in Ghana, interest was already waning in the Kremlin in this difficult competition for the Third World. Pragmatism came before new world orders, and the Soviet's national security came before everything. After intervening in Angola in alliance with Cuba to defeat the South African invasion, why was Moscow prepared to see socialist Mozambique sign a peace accord with the same South African invader? Why has such a powerful image of the ruthless expansion of the Soviet Union so dominated the West? when the reality has been so different. The Soviet view is a defensive view, a conservative world of concentric circles. The further from the center you are, the less you matter. This is first of all accumulation of experience. Since of course the Soviet Union, the Soviet government, the Soviet scholars, they had no experience of dealing with the third world countries in the 50s. We never visited these countries. We, you know, we had no diplomatic relations mainly with them. So this was a terra incognita for many of us. So that's why maybe some uh, over-optimistic views were spelled out. As Mao Zedong in China spoke of the inevitable war between communism and capitalism, the Soviets spoke of peaceful coexistence with the West. While waiting for the inevitable transition to communism, Moscow and its communist allies around the world were ill-prepared for the wave of third world upheavals in the 1960s. Against the dull pragmatism of the Kremlin sprang alternative visions of world revolution, personified by Che Guevara. Porque es la naturaleza del imperialismo la que bestializa a los hombres, la que la convierte en fieras sedientas de sangre que están dispuestas a degollar, a asesinar, a destruir hasta la última imagen de un revolucionario, de un partidario de un régimen que haya caído bajo su bota o que luche por su libertad. Castro and Guevara extolled their vision of rural guerrilla warfare modeled on their own success in Cuba. Guevara said, while the United States is pinned down in Vietnam, let us strike in Africa, in Asia, and everywhere in Latin America. The two things that most worried the Kremlin about the Cuban Revolution was its rejection of the peaceful and gradual road to socialism and its belief that the local communist parties should defer to the revolutionary leadership. At the time of the overthrow of the Batista dictatorship in Havana in 1959, Castro was not yet a communist. The Kremlin feared that guerrilla movements risked the provocation of American intervention 
Moscow would be powerless to influence events in a country which was so far away and where the local Communist Party was so weak. For almost a decade after the Cuban Missile Crisis, Cuba was one of the USSR's most difficult allies. Among the Communist nations, only Yugoslavia, Albania and China were to prove more awkward. You know, the first and the primary thing of which I think, or any other person should think, is of course that Cuba is under constant pressure from the United States. Constant pressure, even geographically. If you see that map with the huge United States and small Cuba, just only 90 miles, I think, of uh, Florida, of course, it's, it, for the Cubans, or the Cubans, they always accept this as a kind of an imminent threat. For the Soviets, the Vietnam War was yet another dilemma. How far could they go towards helping the Vietnamese without damaging their relationship with America? The Vietnamese exploited the rivalry between China and the Soviet Union, who were competing for influence in radical third world circles. A decade later, the balance of power had changed. The US had pulled out of mainland Southeast Asia. China and Vietnam had gone to war. Moscow could no longer hope that Peking would return to a Soviet-dominated alliance as a docile member. Since the birth of the Chinese Communist State in 1947, the Chinese had to come to terms with the mutual hostility between the US and the USSR. Mao had hoped to develop independent relations with both superpowers, but America had rejected Chinese diplomatic overtures. They had no alternative but to lean to the side of the Soviet Union, as Mao called it. Mao had led China to revolution, but he felt that the Soviet Union did not regard them as equals and that they were the junior partner. The Soviet model of development, with its heavy industry and urban industrial workers, was inappropriate for a country based on the land. A break with the Soviet Union became inevitable. In 1964, border tensions seethed into open hostility between the Soviets and the Chinese. Mao felt that Khrushchev was capitulating to the capitalist powers with whom he felt war was inevitable. The Soviet Union now saw China as a major threat to the security of their vast shared borders. By 1969, the growing animosity produced an editorial in Pravda on how the Soviets have used their nuclear arsenal beyond the question of strategic parity. For some, this was interpreted as the hint of a nuclear threat to China. By the 1970s, America was prepared to open the door once closed to China. If China would accept aid and Western technology, then the balance of power would shift drastically. President Nixon's visit to China in 1972 astonished the Kremlin. Only ten years earlier, the Chinese had warned them, you should not oppose socialist China by allying yourself with US imperialism. As we look at this wall, we do not want walls of any kind between peoples and uh, I think one of the results of our trip we hope may be that uh, the walls that are erected uh, whether they are physical walls like this or whether they are other walls of uh, ideology or philosophy uh, will not divide peoples in the world as Chinese allegiances shifted to the US so did their critique of Soviet foreign policy from being allies of US imperialism treacherous to the cause of revolution. China now called the Soviets imperialist and expansionist. China was conducting its own Cold War with the Soviet Union. Understanding non-alignment and nationalism became an increasing obstacle in Moscow's relationships with the Third World. Despite Moscow's great hopes of being a major influence on developments in the Middle East with offers of the supply of arms, the Arabs ignored the political advice that the Soviets assumed should be part of any arms deal. In 
Arab nations have been wary of the advice and influence of an atheistic society which has virtually eliminated private business in its own country. The Egyptian revolution of 1952, led by General Naguib and later Gamal Abdul Nasser, ousted a corrupt monarchy, British occupation, and released Egyptian aspirations freed from centuries of foreign domination. In 1948, when the State of Israel had been declared, the Egyptian army, with other Arab armies, had moved in to support the Palestinian Arabs, but they were defeated with their outmoded weapons and poor supplies. Nasser's priority as the new leader was to secure arms from the United States, which in the early 1950s was still in the grip of anti-communist fervor. In exchange for arms, the US required Egypt to join the Baghdad Pact, a post-war alliance against the Soviet bloc in strategic Middle Eastern territory. Nasser refused, he saw that such a deal with the West would isolate Egypt from Arab unity and hopes of independence. Nasser's campaign against the pact brought him into contact with other non-aligned leaders at the Bandung Conference in 1955. Among others, he met Chu Enlai, the Chinese communist leader, who suggested that since the US would not supply arms, then perhaps the Soviet Union would. The ability to manoeuvre independently between superpowers was a revelation to the Arab world. In retaliation, the US withdrew its offers of aid as a warning to the non-aligned movement. The reconstruction of the Aswan Dam was an important symbol for Egypt in its rebuilding of industry and redistribution of land, and again the Soviet Union stepped into the breach with funds. To the West, Nasser's Egypt had become just an Arab version of communism. But Nasser considered communism alien to Arab nationalism and had imprisoned Egyptian communists. The Soviets frequently called for a diplomatic solution to the war between Egypt and Israel, maintaining that Egypt must eventually recognize Israel's right to exist. The Arab defeat by Israel in 1967 was blamed on the lack of Soviet support. With Brezhnev, of course, the globalism of foreign policy uh, moved into another stage as uh, relations were opened with a whole variety of new countries, as the Soviet Union found itself being invited to intervene in a number of places, particularly in Angola, increasingly, of course, in Vietnam against the United States' uh, presence there, and uh, ultimately in Afghanistan. But, uh, and Brezhnev travelled a great deal himself, uh, in, in Africa, e even before he became the, uh, the general secretary of the party, uh, when he was uh, the president of the Soviet Union. But Brezhnev's character, I think, uh, in spite of his interest in the, uh, the new globalism of Soviet foreign policy, was still dominated by the war, by the Second World War, in which he had fought himself um, as a young officer. As a country which shares its borders with the Soviet Union, Iran has always been an important concern. The first Iranian communists were migrant workers working in the oil industry in Tsarist Russia, but Soviet support for the Iranian Communist Party was unreliable. Despite the fact that they were providing the Shah with military supplies, the Soviets cautiously welcomed the overthrow of the pro-Western regime in 1979. The revolution in Iran was fueled by Islamic fundamentalism and Iran's Communist Party was outlawed in 1982. Soviet weapons supplied to the enemy, Iraq, were now killing Iranians on the front. The Soviets were ejected as an even greater Satan than the United States. Losses for the Americans did not automatically mean Moscow's gain. Game theorists call this the zero-sum game, that in any situation there is a finite amount of advantage. What one side loses, the other side gains. Soviet strategists have been at a loss as to how to respond to the resurgent power of Islamic nationalism on its shared borders with both Iran and Afghanistan. In Central Asia, the majority of the USSR's people are Muslims. The frustrated nationalism of the Third World has sometimes led to the victims of the Cold War striking back at both superpowers. To pro-Iranian factions in the Lebanon, the Soviet embassy was a prime target for attack, 
and Soviet personnel were held as hostages. Many factions see few differences between the superpowers. The Ayatollah Khomeini had a slogan, neither East nor West. Soviet concentration on its border countries took on a greater urgency during the turmoil of Iran and the great claims being made on behalf of Islamic fundamentalism by Khomeini in a country so close to the borders of Afghanistan. Afghanistan's proximity in terms of concentric circles from the Kremlin, coupled with the impending collapse of a pro-Soviet communist government in 1979, was too much for the Soviet defensive mentality to bear. The decision to invade appeared to be the lesser of two evils. President Karmel was placed in control by the Kremlin as Soviet troops invaded the country to assist his administration. In invading Afghanistan, the Soviets had made a radical move with conservative motives. Soviet ideology does not readily accept that revolutions can be reversed. The invasion of Afghanistan represented the first major military action involving Soviet troops outside Europe since the 1940s. The fundamentalism of the Mujahideen guerrillas is of less interest to the Soviets than is their threat to stability in the Soviet position as Afghanistan's major trading partner for the last 20 years. Western fears that the invasion of Afghanistan is evidence of Soviet expansion towards the warm and sensitive waters of the Persian Gulf have not been manifested. The non-aligned countries reacted with dismay and condemnation of this reneging on third world solidarity. There is an old theory that uh, the Soviet foreign policy, or even before that Russian foreign policy, has been influenced with a desire to get access to the warm waters of the Gulf. It's not a new theory. But really, anybody who thought it up in the context of Afghanistan needs to have it, his head examined. In order to reach the Persian Gulf, via Afghanistan, Russians will have to cross three deserts. They will have to cross vast mountain ranges. And Afghanistan itself doesn't have direct access to the Persian waters, uh, Persian Gulf. It will have to go through either Baluchistan or through Iranian territory. In fact, if the Russians want to reach the Persian Gulf, they have a very simple way of doing it. They can reach through Azerbaijan and Iran, why should they go to the Persian Gulf by Afghanistan? I just don't understand this theory. I think it's nonsense. The South African invasion of Angola in 1975 was justified by claims of the protection of Western interests against the growing threat of communism in Southern Africa. Although Southern Africa is an area of low priority for the Soviet Union, Cuba's Castro persuaded Brezhnev to respond to the Angolan request for military aid. The dramatic airlift of military equipment and 15,000 Cuban troops broke with two Soviet conventions and its involvement with the Third World. First, Angola was a distant country, and second, the Soviets got it right. They correctly anticipated the support of the non-aligned movements for their actions to block Pretoria's military advances. The curious thing about Angola is that while the Russians look after Angola's security, its economy is really financed by the Gulf Oil Company, which has operations in Kabinda, and that is where most of the revenue of Angola comes from. So in a sense, uh, there is a kind of a coexistence between the Americans and the uh, Russians in Angola. Commentators argued that Moscow would use its new foothold for further incursions into southern Africa. But a decade of fighting and seven billion dollars worth of war damage in Angola has not prompted Moscow to send in Soviet troops or to supply enough arms to defeat the western-backed South African army occupying southern Angola and Namibia. Despite 11 years of independence, Angola's war has left the economy in ruins and its valuable resources unexploited. The events in Angola did not form part of a Soviet master plan for Southern Africa. To no other South African state has such active support been offered. As far as we are concerned, certainly in Southern Africa, the West 
is composed of countries that are very greedy, very greedy, in the sense that for what they have taken out of Southern Africa, for what they have taken out, say, during the colonial times, what they took out during the colonial times, and also what they continue to take out now through the multinational companies, I mean, surely they could uh, give aid without uh, any of these tied strings. But this is not the case. For the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union do not have a colonial history in Africa that is to be remembered. And therefore, their presence there in Africa is, is either at the invitation of Africa themselves, Africans themselves. The Soviet Union are there in Africa at the invitation of African people. The United States' is presence in Africa is there by force. And that's a fundamental difference. As an ex-colony of Portugal, Mozambique is economically dependent on South Africa. Yet its economy is being destroyed by a war of destabilization with the South African-backed rebel group, the MNR, the Mozambique National Resistance. In the early 1980s, as the South Africans began to arm, train and finance the MNR guerrillas, the Mozambican government found itself unable to guarantee full security throughout its vast and underpopulated territory. It sought help from the Zimbabwean army, and the Soviets provided economic aid and some military training. In its attempts to satisfy nationalist needs while at the same time dealing with both South Africa and the West, Mozambique finds itself not entirely trusted by the Soviet Union. The Soviets are reluctant to bear the financial burden of propping up the failing Mozambican economy and to open up a second military front with South Africa. They have done little to aid their allies beyond supplying some weaponry. Faced with drought, recession and guerrilla sabotage, signing a treaty of non-aggression with its enemy, South Africa, had become a matter of life or death for the Mozambican government. This humiliating move was made almost inevitable by the trap that Mozambique was being forced into by both East and West. Despite the peace accord, South Africa has continued to push what they call Moscow's puppets into a deepening spiral of economic ruin. The Soviets have scarcely a dozen allies from over 100 third world countries. Their inexperience has led to miscalculations. Western pressure actually sets the trap into which the Soviets often push a client state. A former colony emerges into independence. After initial acceptance, the socialist government comes under economic and political pressure from the West. It turns to the Soviet Union for aid. So attacks increase from the West. The Soviet Union does little or nothing to help militarily or economically. The trap is shut on a once liberated country. The downward spiral continues. With every appeal to the Soviets for help, the West strengthens the counter-revolutionaries' attacks. Revolutions of the 60s and 70s turn into the counter-revolutions of the 80s and 90s. Nicaragua is even more tied to the American-dominated world market system than Mozambique. Nicaragua's response to its former status as a banana republic was to develop a mixed economy and an official policy of non-alignment. In retaliation, the United States in 1981 withdrew aid and then poured hundreds of millions of dollars into backing the Contras to destroy the Nicaraguan economy and topple the Sandinista government. This is the threat. Fleets of Soviet-built helicopter gunships, Cuban pilots, support the president on Nicaragua. Now that we know. Now comes the crucial test for the Congress of the United States. Will they provide the assistance the freedom fighters need to deal with Russian tanks and gunships or will they abandon the democratic resistance to its communist enemy? The initial appeal by Nicaragua to Soviet socialist countries for aid and solidarity fell on deaf ears. As the situation worsened, Nicaraguan President Ortega had to visit Moscow several times for help. The distance Ortega traveled was perhaps a measure of Soviet reluctance or inability to give substantial aid. On each occasion, the Kremlin has marginally increased military aid while urging Managua to improve relations with the United States. <laughs> 
I would agree to a freeze if only we could freeze the Soviets' global desires. But if history teaches anything, it teaches that simple-minded appeasement or wishful thinking about our adversaries is folly. It means the betrayal of our past, the squandering of our freedom. To ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an evil empire, to simply call the arms race a giant misunderstanding, and thereby remove yourself from the struggle between right and wrong and good and evil. The White House has used Ortega's meetings at the Kremlin as proof that Nicaragua is a Soviet surrogate, that this therefore justified the escalation of the economic and military state of siege. The people are tired from the war, you know, especially in the, the people in the peripheral areas who sometimes can hardly understand the difference, the difference between those and those, you know, who, can, who don't understand anything. They understand simply that there is no peace, that uh, there is always a danger of death, and they need urgently some peace at least. You know, so all that in combination, plus the permanent hostility on the part of the United States, the permanent threat of an invasion or some bombardment or something like that when the American press, you know, publicly discusses what will the United States do with, uh, with Nicaragua, bombard it or just send Marines or something else. It's also, also a, very, a very hard strain on the country and on the government, on its public. Increases in the U.S. funding for covert operations in Mozambique and Nicaragua are a bleak prospect for both countries. The future for them is a continued drain of much needed resources on military defenses and ever increasing destruction from the war. Where does this leave those third world countries now under attack? Does the spiral of decay experienced in Nicaragua and Mozambique, caught between the two superpowers, set the pattern for the stalemate of the Cold War trap? Now I think the Russians are more interested uh, in uh, the non-alignment content of the third world policies, uh, more interested in third world support for broader global issues like disarmament and change in the economic order in the world and so on, and less interested in the ideological outlook of the third world countries. The third world is not interested in being turned into an arena of a confrontation between East and West. Nobody. Uh, well, there are people who are interested in playing that sort of a game because some regimes uh, have uh, carved themselves in nice ecological niches in the Cold War and uh, have benefited by that. But as far as people are concerned, they are interested in the solution of their problems, their hunger, poverty, backwardness, and so on, and development. Uh, and I think that it, it opens up uh, huge vistas for East-West cooperations. The primary area of concern for Gorbachev is the United States. The secondary area of concern is Europe. Japan comes into that also because Japan is increasingly being treated as part of the Western alliance. And uh, uh, then China is, of course, an area of great concern. And there are signs that uh, relations there are on the mend, although Gorbachev, one must say, has not made any dramatic overtures to China. He hasn't... Uh, made a huge number of concessions or changed the basic uh, setup of the diplomacy which he inherited from Andropov or Brezhnev. So the third world, I think, comes right at the, the end of the list. We first of all understand that these are independent countries. Uh, the choice of their way of development is purely their domestic affairs. Affair. It can be sometimes influenced by the Soviet experience or by the American experience. It, you know, it is completely something which to be sold by, by the people, by, by the political parties, by, by political leaders of those countries. That's the rule which can, should be accepted both in any, in any developed country, east, west, anywhere. In their maneuvering, in their superpower maneuvering, the peoples of the third world are being moved about as pawns and they're actually suffering real wars while there is a competition for sea lanes or competition in the Indian Ocean competition, in the Atlantic Ocean competition for this. And in that process of competition, there is actual suffering, actual human suffering. People die because of that competition. <laughs> 
Most countries prefer to be free of either superpower's influence, especially as the Soviets are seen as not entirely dependable against outside attack. In foreign policy, third world countries increasingly wish to be non-aligned. Keeping a certain level of tension in Europe helped the Soviets justify the status quo, which gives them control over Eastern Europe and reduces the chances of a major change in the balance of power. In the Third World, where politics are more volatile, the Cold War is much less useful for Moscow. Given the American lead in economic, political and military influence, East-West tension makes it easier for America to maintain its position. The USSR has no choice but to court the United States. foreign policy is based on a new realization of the dangers and the possibilities which exist in today's world. As far as dangers are concerned, the danger of a nuclear war, the danger of the continuing arms race, uh, the danger of the ecological crisis, actually the, of the exacerbation of the existing ecological crisis, those dangers uh, and others the dangers which have to do with the sorry state of many countries in the third world, hunger, underdevelopment, diseases. You have a whole range of global problems like that, which pose a challenge to both the Soviet Union uh, and the United States, both East and West. И новые мышления вещи очень заразительные. Рано или поздно оно должно будет восторжествовать и в Соединенных Штатах, и в Западной Европе. Вот это тоже форма соперничества, форма соревнований между Востоком и Западом, соревнований в области новых идей, в области безопасности, сотрудничества и так далее.